I just saw the headline so far, but I can tell this is going to be a rough one. The climate change paper is so depressing, it's sending people to therapy. Fuck. On average, three people read an academic paper. <laughs> that right there is really freaking funny. I, I've been in academia, and even I'm surprised it's that low. Three people. On average, three people reading it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that headline's supposed to be sarcastic. I don't know if it's an actual real statistic. But it's believable that it could be. Um, if you've ever been to an academic conference before, it is just colleagues showing their papers to their colleagues. And most of it is just written in a, in a way that it will never see the light of day ever. And in many cases, that's a good thing. You know, when I interviewed uh, Dr. Robert McChesney, I was in graduate school. Uh, Dr. Robert McChesney is a, a, one of my favorite media theorists. I recommend reading his book and starting with The Problem of the Media. He has a bunch of books, but start with that one. Um, or The Death of American Journalism. That's another good one. But anyway, uh, I interviewed him years ago, and this was when I was still in academia myself, and I had a bit more of an idealistic attitude towards academia. And I, I asked him a question. I was like, you know, there's sort of this disconnect between the kind of practical application world and academia. Do you think that's a bad thing? Do you think we should try to bridge this divide? And academics like him or some of the people bridging that divide, uh, in his answer to me, which was freaking hilarious, and he wasn't even trying to be funny, he said, no, I don't, because most, most academia is so boring and useless that it's good that most people are shielded from it. <laughs> And he wasn't trying to be funny, but I just bust out laughing when he said that. I thought that was a hilarious response because it was. Uh, uh, anyway, so three people. There you go. On average, three people read an academic paper. At least 100,000 have read this, and a lot of them haven't taken it very well. What if I told you there was a paper on climate change that was so uniquely catastrophic, so perspective-altering, and so absolutely depressing that it's sent to people to support groups, uh, that it's sent to that it sent people, excuse me, to support groups and encouraged them to quit their jobs and move to the countryside. Good news, there is. It's called Deep Adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy. I was introduced to it via an unlikely source, a guy in advertising who left his job to become a full-time environmental campaigner. We're fucked, he told me. I wonder if that's in the paper. I wonder if that, that should just be the title. Just, we're fucked. I'd like to present my uh, dissertation. What is the title of your dissertation? Uh, we're fucked. And it's on environmental catastrophe. Okay, continue. So when you were writing, we're fucked. Um, when did you know that we were, in fact, fucked? Chair of the department, I'm glad you asked this question. I realized we were fucked um, when I woke up one morning and there were 17 headlines about Stormy Daniels. Uh, meanwhile, the caps were still melting a fuckload. Um, and I thought, wow, we're fucked. And then I drank an entire gallon of co coffee and wrote this entire dissertation uh, because that's how fucked we are. Ironically enough, I printed this dissertation on paper, uh, which was a waste of it. You all should just have it electronically on your iPads. Um, and we're really freaking screwed. I try to do what I can as an individual, but really that pales in comparison because if we don't do something to rein in these predatory companies, uh, we're really royally fucked. And none of that's going to happen because we actually celebrate these predatory companies. Hey, a bunch of cities just got on their knees and groveled for Amazon to come to their town and fuck it up. They have an F rating for the environment, by the way. So does Walmart and pretty much everybody else. Oh, and Howard Schultz might run for president. Uh, we're fucked. We're really, really fucked because at the policy level, there's nothing we're going to do about this. We don't even have support from the party that's supposed to be the environmental party when it comes to a Green New Deal. So, um... Yeah, that's when I realized we're fucked. We're fucked really hard. Here's the shit that's happening. And um, I don't even know why I want to get this doctor next to my name because it won't matter. So you can either pass me or not pass me. I don't give a shit anymore. I should be enjoying myself at the beach right now because we're fucked and I should enjoy what we have left. I'm wasting my time in this room doing this colloquium with you guys, trying to get a piece of paper telling me I'm worth something. Uh, fuck you, fuck your piece of paper, and that's my dissertation. And then the chair of the department says, A+. plus. All right, back to this. Deep Adaptation is quite like any other academic paper. First of all, it has a cool title. Sounds like it could be a movie. That's pretty freaking cool. 
There's the language. We are about to play Russian roulette with the entire human race with already two bullets loaded. There's the flashes of dark humor. I was only joking. I was only partly joking earlier when I questioned why I was even writing this paper. But most of all, there's the stark conclusions that it draws about the future, chiefly that it's too late to stop climate change from devastating our world and that climate-induced societal collapse is inevitable in the near term. How near? About a decade. Professor, Professor Jem Bendel, a sustainability academic at the University of Cumbria, wrote the paper after taking a sabbatical at the end of 2017 to review and understand the latest climate science properly, not sitting on the fence anymore as he puts it down the... F as he puts it down the phone to me as he puts it down the phone to me okay what he found terrified him the evidence before us suggests that we are set for disruptive and uncontrollable levels of climate change bringing starvation destruction migration disease and war he writes in the paper our norms of behavior that we call our civilization may also degrade it is time he adds we consider the implications of being too late to avert a global environmental catastrophe in the lifetimes of people alive today even a schmuck like me is familiar with some of the evidence Bendel sets out to prove his point. You only need to step outside during the record-breaking heat wave last year. Okay. Eric Betunos, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, a senior researcher at the Tendal Center for Climate Change Research, tells me that Bendel's conclusions may sound extreme, but he agrees with the report's overall assessment. I think societal collapse is indeed inevitable. He says, though adds, the process is likely to take decades to centuries. Wow, that <laughs> that's, uh, wow. Can we be a little more vague on the time frame there? Uh, this guy will never run a delivery service. Hey, we got your food. We're going to deliver it. What, when's it going to be delivered in? Minutes to hours. It's going to be there minutes to hours. Decades to centuries. I mean, I hope this dude's right. I hope the 10 years guy is, is a little off, and I hope this other dude's right, that it could take decades to centuries. And by decades, I'm hoping for at least, I don't know, like at least 10, right? I mean, I'm, I mean, I could say five and be totally selfish here, but I, I want to say, yeah, I want, but let's, let's try to prolong our stay here. I think Earth is pretty freaking rad. Put that on a t-shirt. Earth's pretty freaking rad. Ron Placone, let's try to stay here longer. Because, by the way, the planet ain't going anywhere. We are, as George Carlin said. Planet ain't going, we're going somewhere. Let's try to extend our stay. No matter what, we're a parasite. We're a disease. Let's try to be a common cold instead of a deadly uh, virus. Let's just try to be the common cold. Earth can live with the common cold for a long, long time, and that'd be great. All right, so let's see what else is here. Wouldn't it be funny if, like, one stream I just re I read the entire thing? Like, we just dedicated one stream. Let me know. At the end of the show today, let me know if you want me to do that. Because uh, if enough of you guys genuinely wanted me to do that, I would do it. Where we just read the entire freaking paper as a dedicated stream. Uh, it might take longer than an hour. But uh, I'll do it if you guys want. That could be like an entire week. We just read that whole freaking paper. <laughs> All right. Jem's paper is in Maine, well-researched and supported by relatively mainstream climate science. That's why I'm with him on the fundamentals, and more and more people are. Reed's key disagreement with Bendel is his belief we still have time to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, saying, I think it's hubris to think that we know the future, but that doesn't mean Bendel's premise is wrong. The way I see it, deep adaptation is insurance against the possibility, or rather the probability, of some kind of collapse, says Reed. Deep adaptation is saying, what do we need to do if collapse is something we need to realistically plan for? When I speak to Bendel, he tells me he thinks of deep adaptation as more of an ethical and philosophical framework rather than a prophecy about the future of the planet. The longer we refuse to talk about climate change is already here and screwing with our way of life because we don't want to think like that because it's too frightening or will somehow demotivate people, uh, the less time we have to reduce harm. That's very fair. What does he mean by harm? Starvation is the first one, he answers, pointing to lowering harvest of grain in Europe in 2018 due to drought. 
In what scientific in the scientific community at the moment, the appropriate thing to, is to say that 2018 was an anomaly. However, if you look at what's been happening over the last few years, it isn't an anomaly. There's a possibility that 2018 is the new best case scenario. That means, in Bendel's view, that governments need to start planning emergency responses to climate change, including including growing and stockpiling food. Remember when I told you about my science buddy? I told you guys about my science buddy, and I said, dude, are we as fucked as I feel like we are? And he said, look, I don't think the planet's going to end anytime soon, or rather, our stay on the planet's going to end anytime soon. Don't invest in coastal property. Start saving seeds. That's what he said to me. He's like, don't invest in coastal property. Start saving seeds. Accept the reality that in 50 years, the earth is probably going to look unrecognizable to us. We're probably not going to recognize this fucking place. We'll be telling our grandchildren what it used to look like. And hey, maybe it'll look cooler. I don't know. <laughs> but it won't be. I, I hope I hope coastlines are still a thing, obviously. I mean, I feel like those will inevitably be there, right? Where they'll be is the big question. I might have a coastal property here in Pasadena. Well, except I'm a renter, so I will not have coastal property <laughs> here in Pasadena. I may pay rent in a coastal town. <laughs> All right. Should people start building bunkers and buying bulletproof vests? There's no way of getting this through unless we try together, he says. We need to help people stay fed and watered where they live already to reduce disruption and reduce civil unrest as much as we can. Of the Silicon Valley financers prepping for the apocalypse in New Zealand, he says, Once money doesn't matter anymore and the armed guards are trying to feed their starving children, what do you think they'll do? The billionaires doing that are just deluded. Bendel wasn't always this gloomy about the state of the world. He once worked for WWF. Uh, oh, that's not the wrestling thing. One of the biggest environmental charities in the world, and in 2012 founded the Institute for Leadership and Sustainability at the University of Cumbria. The World Economic Forum named him a young global leader for his work. So how did he end up writing a paper that determined that civilization and environmental sustainability, as we currently understand it, is doomed? Since the age of 15, I've been an environmentalist. Really? That's, I'll be honest, I was not worried very much about the environment in f at 15. At 15, I was worried about two things. Does this girl like me? When is my punk band practicing next? Those were the only things I was worried about at 15. Um, that was about it. Yeah, I wasn't, I mean, hey, what can I say? I wasn't worried about the environment at 15. I should have been, I wasn't. Uh... I've given my life professionally and personally. I'm a workaholic, and it was all about sustainability. Once he sat down with the data, however, he realized his field was quickly becoming irrelevant in the face of oncoming climate catastrophe. It would mean not getting super excited about the expansion of your recycling program in a major multinational. It's a completely different paradigm of what we should be looking at. What he didn't expect was the paper was for the paper to take off online. It was aimed at those people in my professional community and why we're in denial. When I put it out there, I didn't expect 15-year-olds in schools in Indonesia to be reading it with their teachers. He says that deep adaptation has been downloaded over 110,000 times since it was released by IFLAS as an occasional paper. Oh, everyone's talking about it. Deep adaptation, dude. It's all the frickin' rage. So some, pa some places didn't want to publish it. Climate gloom and doom is nothing new. Doomsday preppers have been stockpiling the freeze-dried fruit, blah, blah, blah. But Bendel's paper appears to have hit a, a unique nerve, especially given that the average scientific paper is estimated to be read by only three years. Oh, so that is a real statistic. I'm glad we kept going here. That is a real statistic. Three people. Three freaking people. So that means there's many cases where I'm one of three people. That's kind of neat. I didn't know that. And I have an academic paper that's published out there, and I guess three people have read it. It's cited in a textbook that I myself have never read. Uh, the best part is, I think I told, I talked about this before. So I, but um, a paper that I wrote that was published in 2012. I want to say 2012. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Contemporary Rhetoric. Uh, it's called "Interrupting the Machine." Check it out if you want to read an academic paper that two other people have read. Be the third. Be the third and read my academic paper that I co-authored with a very wonderful uh, colleague of mine. And um, it was used in a textbook, and my colleague who I co-authored the paper with uh, emailed me to show me the textbook. I didn't know about it. I would have never found out about it. But he's like, hey, by the way, when they do that, they don't even need to tell you. Like in the academic world, they don't even need to say, hey, your shit's in our textbook. 
You want a free copy. They don't even have to do that. They don't have, because it's all for educational purposes. I feel like they should just let you know. Like, I'm not expecting any type of compensation, but couldn't they just let you know? Especially, like, my paper was published uh, electronically, too. So my email address is, like, right frickin' there. They couldn't have just been like, hey, just so you know. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, so I saw that we're in a textbook. And the funniest part is they asked a reading question about the paper I wrote. And I didn't reread my article, but I read the question and I didn't know the fucking answer. Like, I read this question. They were like, what was Placone, who's who's me, what was Placone inferring about da 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 And I'm like, shit, I don't know. I don't know what I was inferring there. I uh, I don't care. So I think if any student across the, the, the world would say Placone doesn't give a shit, you would have to give them credit for that. Because I'm Placone in this scenario, and I don't give a shit. They'd have to give that student an A. And then the student could cite this video. Be like, Professor, I'm sorry, Placone doesn't give a shit. You know that guy? He doesn't give a shit. He's in our textbook. He doesn't care. Um, he doesn't remember what he was inferring there, but he knows that it's not important and that we should just grasp the deeper, grasp the deeper concepts explored in this paper, which this question does not allude to. So Placone doesn't care. That was my answer. I was like, the answer, Placone doesn't care. Placone, there we go. All right. Let's see if there's anything more to this. So this is, uh, Bendel himself says he's still working out how he can, how much he can reconcile his job as an academic with his newfound conclusions about the state of the future. I think the reason why my framing in my paper took off is that it's maybe the first time a social scientist was saying these things categorically. We are seemingly in denial. It's time to break that taboo and have a serious conversation about what we do now. Well, I think this guy is on his way to academic stardom. He's going to be an academic superstar now. And he's going to do talks and he's going to do books. I mean, obviously, this dissertation, if it hasn't been already, it should be put in a book. It shouldn't just be available electronically. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. And I might read it to you guys. <laughs> but I'm for sure going to read it. And I'm going to read it cover to cover. And then I'm probably going to text all my, uh, you know, my cousin who is a scientist and my buddy from high school who is a scientist and any other scientists I know. I'm going to be like, hey, can you help? And they'll be like, Ron, dude, you're having another one of those moments. Are you expecting a child? What the fuck? You do this every so often, which I do to my scientist friends. I text them and I'm like, how fucked are we? And they're like, dude, is this, is this for your show? Like, what? And I was like, sort of. Yes. How fucked are we? Um, I am going to text some of my friends after this. And I'm going to ask them if they read this. I'm going to be like, did you read this? How I can they're like, Ron, I'm just one scientist, dude. And I'm like, yes, but I, I got to I gotta hang my hat on something that gives me a little bit of optimism. And you're it, dude. You're it. This is, re we reuse all the, all the, my fiance saves everything now. She saves everything. And I'm like, look, this is awesome. We're doing the best we can as individuals. But really, we need the powers that be need to do something. It's, it's not all in our hands. Well, if every individual... No, it, it needs to be bigger than that. It needs, it's good we do what we can. We do, like, we compost. Uh, we take that trip. We do the recycling thing. My fiance saves everything now. She saves every single thing. Uh, and we try to reuse it to the point where... This morning, she has these, like, parking tabs that she has to get when she, when she goes into the parking lot for where she works. She has to get these little, like, tabs uh, to put on her windshield wipers. And uh, she actually gave those to me, and she was like, you can use this to write down library card numbers when you're going to the library. Because they go to my library all the freaking time. And uh, I actually was like, yes, I should do that. <laughs> I took them. We saved them. They're these little, little, like, little things. Like, they're these little squares. I don't even know if an entire library call number could fit on them. I guess we're going to find out. So, uh, yeah. Let's enjoy libraries while we still got them. Let's uh, enjoy the planet while we still got them. I tweeted out this link. So, if you want to get a link to this dude's entire paper, um, you can. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tweet me an article at Ron Placone. We'll go through it together and make